Now, imagine how bizarre it would be on a cold, frosty morning like this to go digging in the dirt. Imagine who would do such a thing. Well, I can tell you that somebody who would love to do that, because all he ever thinks of is digging in the dirt, is our very own... I'm just trying to fill and find a jingle here somewhere, Chris. Um, uh, where was I up to? Yeah, basically, uh, he likes digging in the dirt. I've found it. Thank goodness for that. I mean, there's only so far that I can fill, to be honest with you. And then even I start going, I'm, I'm drying up here. I'm drying up. So, <laughs> live from his home, yes. at the moment, we can go. In fact, Chris, I don't know where your home is. Obviously, I don't want the whole address, but whereabouts is it? <laughs> yeah, I live about 30 minutes away from where Morland's College is. So, uh, it's uh, on the way up to Salisbury, uh, near a, a place called Fording Bridge, if people know this kind of area. So, I was actually pastor of a church uh, uh, here for a good 10 years or so before I started at Morland's College, but I still live in the, the area where my, my children grew up. So this is actually my son's room as well, I might, might point out. It's full of wonderful <laughs> things. It's like like the Tomb of Tutankhamun, but with video game and uh, Lord of the Rings related stuff. <laughs> and, dare I say, probably less tidy than the tomb was. Since, yeah, <laughs> that's right, since I've been using it, it's got even tidier <laughs> and tidier. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, do you know, we have so much great feedback about this feature, and okay. I, I'm going to say it out there, this is one of my favourite of the week, because we get to learn, but we get to do it in a non-sort of boring way. Does that make sense? Like, I've, I've never seen Chris ever wear what you would expect a lecturer to wear. So, sort of like those those corduroy suit tops where they've got on the elbows, they've decided to put pads on because they're wearing away. Why would a lecturer have such stress on the elbow area, Chris? Yeah, well, it, it must be, you know, leaning on a desk, I suppose. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> I tell you what, okay, Gareth, I, I'm going to confess something, though. Uh, I was dressed in a very peculiar way on Friday because it was our graduation uh, service at college. When the students graduate, the robes come out. So I will post, I will um, get the photo to you somehow this morning and uh, you'll see what I look like when it's a real formal academic occasion. Never mind the photo, why don't you wear it next week? Because <laughs> we rent them. They're too expensive to you buy. You have your own one. I don't have my own one. It would be a lot of money. It's not worth it. Only wear it once a year. <laughs> Yeah, but, you know, oh, yeah, but... No! You, you're only, I guess, officially should be wearing it once a year, but I'd be answering the door when the takeaway man arrives and everything in it, if I was you. It's a bit like, so, a friend of mine is a police officer, and obviously she's not allowed to bring home, if you want to call them weapons, you have to leave them on site, but she is allowed to bring home the whole uniform. And I was like, do you know, if I was you, I don't know if there's any laws against this, by the way, but I'd be wearing it all the time. If, I would somebody, bought the robes, if somebody bought me the robes, I'd be tempted to wear them a lot, but uh, I'm not spending money on something like right, that. Ladies and gentlemen, our next appeal is not to raise crucial funds for the radio station. It's to buy Chris some robes. You see, I remember when I went to secondary school or big school, as we call it, um, we used to have something in the summertime called Founders Day, and it's it would be a ceremony of the founders of the school, and you'd have to walk around the Oldham area. The kids used to hate it, but the teachers, they must have had their own robes because they would wear them. Wow. Yeah. And they must have... They must have either bought them especially to do Founders Day or they must have bought them previously and gone, well, I'll never use this. And then he got the job at our school and thought, what? Twice a year I could wear them now? incredible you know the kind of mortarboard you know the flat topped uh hat you i've got the... one now here chris in fact you go oh, look at your face oh, then well you know you know those ones. i got a hat. yeah i don't know it's a surprise then uh, i'm gonna have with uh, the sort of pudding it's sort of like a pudding top that i get so it's kind of like look i'll send you a photo and we can see this there. we can put it out there and you can see what i mean when did the mortarboard become a pudding top well, it depends what qualification you get. There are even stranger ones than that. Uh, one of the members of staff who graduated from somewhere else got a really odd-looking red one that has like a like a pirate's kind of thing, like a tri-corner uh, hat, but bright red. So <laughs> there are so, multiple types of hats. Would you say that maybe the stranger the hat, the higher the qualification? Yes. 
Yes, I think that's how they've done it. I think what happened is the higher the qualification, the more the designers thought, let's take the mickey. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, yeah. He's just wasted, or she, well, not wasted, but they have invested 22 years of their life getting this qualification. Let's make them wear something absolutely ridiculous. And here we go for it. Um, So, Chris, it's always a pleasure to have you on. We'll speak again next week. I'm only joking. Um, So we are going to be talking about digging in the dirt because you, each week, you bring us an artifact and I try my very best to describe it so that the people listening can have a slight inkling of what it could be. So what are we doing this week? Okay. Now I'm going to show on the screen for you, Gareth, and uh, if you help me describe it, we'll see uh, if listeners can kind of guess what this might be. For scale, I'm holding it by my my head here, and then I'm going to move on into the camera. So those who are able to watch it later on will get an idea of what this is. Actually, do you know, in this light, that looks actually, I would have to say, Gareth, I think that looks quite beautiful. What do you, th- what, how would you describe that? So when I was a child and we used to do clay modeling, the teacher would have this great big long piece of clay and then divide it up and we'd all have a piece each. That's sort of what it looks like, but there seems to be some imprint on it. Now, I can't see that close enough. Hold it in a bit. That, that, it, it's sort of rigid. It's got lots of patterns on it. And it's a long piece of what I imagine is clay or some sort of pot. And it's been broken off at the top slightly. If you just turn, yes, there we go. So it looks like it's broken off something. Now, what I'm going to, going to go for here is I think that's some sort of printing thing. I can imagine that they would have put that in some sort of die and then pressed it down to get an imprint on something. I'm probably completely wrong on this. That's not bad. Uh, not bad at all. Uh, it, it is writing. Okay, and we're going to talk about this. This is going back to the very earliest writing. This is one of the earliest written documents found anywhere in the world. And it's found in Nineveh, of all places, where Jonah went. And this is one of the earliest texts, the earliest documents that we've actually got. And you are looking at writing here from nearly, well, it goes back to to nearly 4,000 years ago. This particular one's 3,000 years old, but it goes way, way back in time. And this is a written document. And you're absolutely right. Clay, it's a clay tablet about the size of a mobile phone. And we'll be able to talk about what this writing is and what it tells us, because it's pretty astonishing to be able to read something written so long ago. Well, more on that in just a moment. So wait where you are, Chris. Don't you be going anywhere. And we'll be talking a bit more in depth about what this clay thing is that Chris is currently holding up to the camera. Remember, you will be able to see this later when it goes up on our Facebook page. So this is really interesting. Just before we heard that by Jeremy Loop, it's called Gold, by the way, uh, we were talking about what Chris is holding up here to the camera. And again, you will be able to see this later uh, when we put the video up. Chris is from Moreland's College, by the way. Uh, He's a senior lecturer there. And um, if you would like to find out more about the college and what they're doing at the moment and how you can sign up for a course. But first of all, go and have a look at their prospectus. You see what's available. You can apply online Uh, they've got loads of things happening you can book an open day and you can go and see actually the beautiful place that it is Mullins College Uh, Andy Godfrey our resident film reviewer he went there Uh, I think he was a student in 1936 back at Mullins there Uh, but he went to see uh, Chris's film being screened which we'll talk about in a minute but he said it's a truly beautiful place there Um, so Chris you told us a little bit about this artifact you told us that um, it was language and it's made of pot. Tell us a bit more. Great. That's right. Well, here we are. We're going back now to one of the earliest forms of writing found anywhere in the world. And technical word coming up, it's called cuneiform. Okay, I'm just holding it up to the camera. Just little lines that are kind of scratched into clay, wet clay it would have been, and then dried out. And this was one of the earliest forms of writing. And they wrote these documents to record lots of different things. Uh, Legal issues, receipts for buying uh, animals or whatever it might be. But this is one tablet of seven that were found in Nineveh. Now, the tablets themselves date to something like 
two and a half thousand uh, years ago, 650 BC. But they record a story that's been copied and copied and copied. And because of other fragments we found elsewhere, we know that this is part of a story that goes back to about 1750 BC. Now that means it's nearly 4,000 years old. So this is one of the earliest stories found anywhere in the world. Now, what's the story all about? It's called the Enuma Elish, which means the creation account. It's a creation account from the, the world of Babylon and Sumeria, these ancient peoples, and they wrote it down on these tablets. It tells a story of creation and it goes through lots of details about creation. Now, Morelands, we study the Bible and of course we know the Bible begins in the beginning, Genesis, in the beginning, when God made the heavens and the earth. And of course that means that creation is foundational to the whole story of the Bible. Now, the discovery of these writings, these discovery of these documents means we know what other people thought about creation. And there are some things that are similar and some things that are very different. Uh, very different things is they believed in many gods. The Bible is one God. Uh, difference is they believed the gods were like a family having a squabble. The Bible is very clear there is one God who is holy and pure and in command. Uh, the creation account in here leads to a, an amazing story and it's the story of a great flood that the gods sent on the earth and th this tells the story of a flood in fact we've got many versions of this from babylon this great flood and i'll tell you this gareth i mean this is stunning when you see it you see it at the british museum one of these tablets describes in so much detail the flood and remember this is from thousands of years ago it describes the gods calling a man He's called Utnapishtim, but it's the Babylonian Noah, calling a man to build a boat to protect him and his family and the animals from the great flood that's going to be sent. And the story tells of how the, the boat preserves the family and the animals. And then when the waters settle, it, it lands there on, on the mountains, Mount Ararat, where they're, they're safe from the flood and they can repopulate the earth again. Now, isn't it amazing? We read these things in the Bible and yet we discover parallel stories in the ancient world and we've actually got the texts themselves that tell us what they thought some people would say oh well, this means the bible stole it you know the story was invented by the pagans and the israelites came along and stole the story i tell you that's not what it tells us at all what this tells us is there was a real event in history and as you would expect it's not just the bible that records a real event other people remembered this event as well and the story got handed down and other people remembered and wrote it down and so the flood account we read in the bible and the creation account itself it's very sober it's very believable it's very uh, carefully written but these pagan myths they're a bit muddled they're a bit confused <laughs> they're incomplete but they do remind us that they talk about a common event in the ancient world. And it's exactly what we should expect. If the book of Genesis is true, if it's revealing real things about the ancient world, then lo and behold, we find other writings from the ancient world telling us about those same events. So, Enuma Elish, written document, ancient writing. You know, truly amazing. I do wish, Chris, that there was a little miniature version of you that I could keep in my pocket. <laughs> and just basically bring out during these conversations I have with people during the week and go, Chris, come on, explain it, please, for us. <laughs> um, you are a blessing. And thank you for being on the show, Chris. Remember, uh, Moreland's College is where you need to take a look at their website, especially. They're on all the socials. And maybe just this feature alone, or you've been listening for a few weeks, is really sparked an interest in Christianity. And, you know, finding out the evidence for Christianity, well, that is what Moreland's Moreland is all about and there's courses available there's full-time there's part-time and needless to say it's in a beautiful location as well imagine it on a gorgeous summer's day studying out on the grassy bits the grassy bits uh, who will be performing live in the live lounge by the way later uh, moorlands.ac.uk is where you need to go to chris thank you very much and he will be back with some more artifacts next week <laughs>